Welcome to Access Asia. I'm Molly Hall coming up in the show. A special program in India puts New Delhi police on the hunt for the country's lost children. And preserving global heritage or glorifying war. One Japanese city tries to get UN recognition of kamikaze pilot letters. Plus, we'll have a Vietnamese architect's quest for sustainable, low-cost housing. But first, they're known in India as the lost children. 11 million youths have gone missing from their homes, mostly trafficked to other parts of the country, unable to return. Well, after years of denial of this dark reality, one police officer has tried to make a difference. Operation Smile was created last September, this in an attempt to rescue the missing kids. Today, in this New Delhi railway station, the police are on a special mission. Among the dozens of children here, they must seek out those who have gone missing from their homes. But establishing trust is not easy. Scarred and scared, these children often view the police with suspicion. Do you live with your parents? We won't hurt you. Have you eaten today? The boy remains silent. Without a definite answer, the police are bound by law and cannot take him into custody on mere suspicion. So they apply the new procedure for such cases. We take a photograph and when we get back to the station, we'll open a file on him. If it's a lost child, his photo will be published in newspapers and on TV. And his parents will hopefully see it and contact us. The approach seems elementary, but the task is colossal. There are approximately 11 million so-called lost children in India. Mostly, these are runaways or victims of trafficking, forced into all kinds of work. The police launched Operation Smile in Ghaziabad, an industrial suburb of New Delhi. Under this scheme, almost 3,000 children have been found and saved, many even released from slavery. Operation Smile is the brainchild of Police Commissioner Ranvijay Singh. Under him, a database of missing children has been created using photos, news reports and interviews. They are put to beggings, they are put to deck pickings, they are put to, you know, slavery or labor, labor kind of thing here and there. They, they look for such kids, you know, loitering at the public places. The results of these operations are encouraging. 326 children rescued last month alone. Of these, 300 have been reunited with their families. Mr. Singh shows us pictures of one such successful story. Mohit, who was returned to his family after four years. We uh, got her, you know, uh, that grandson back. So she was happy and out of that happiness, she caught hold of us. <laughs> So we went to meet Mohit and his family. Four years ago, he had run away from home and ended up at Jaipur railway station. Unable to go back, he survived by selling plastic bottles for a few pennies. The day he left, the house was plunged into a deep sadness. Over the past four years, I've looked everywhere for him. We've spent over 45,000 rupees in trying to find him. We stopped once we ran out of money. But not all of the children have the same fate. In this orphanage, kids wonder if they too will be able to see their parents again. Since Operation Smile began its rescue missions, the centre has been full of children. But among those rescued are also kids like Ram. A drug addict for many years, he now suffers from irreversible side effects. There are children with mental health problems because of drugs. We have three like that. And they have been unable to tell us where they're from. Despite repeated calls on TV and in newspapers, no one has come to claim these children yet. But at least in here, they are safe from the violence out there on the streets, where almost 50,000 lost children are added annually. Well, now one city in Japan is trying to get the United Nations to register letters by World War II kamikaze pilots. The documents would go alongside the diaries of Anne Frank and the Magna Carta. Well, it's a controversial bid that has already failed once. Critics say it's a glorification of war. But the city's mayor defends the application, saying the farewell notes bear testament to the brutality of World War II. Here's Richelle Harrison Pless. They've been dubbed the valuable last words of Japanese kamikaze. 
Young pilots who crashed their aircraft into World War II Allied ships, part of Japan's desperate final effort to turn the tide of war and halt a U.S. invasion. After a failed bid last year, the Japanese city of Minamikushu renewed efforts to enshrine these pilots' farewell letters as important global heritage. This, despite criticism, it would glorify war. We cannot change the fact that Japan hurt many inside and outside the country during the war. We want to make an effort not to repeat the same mistake again. The move was condemned by China, where memories of Japan's occupation run deep. It blasted the bid as, quote, an effort to beautify Japan's history of militaristic aggression. But others say the letters bear testament to the brutality of World War II. This application and the efforts behind it are in themselves significant and newsworthy. I also want to make it clear right from the start that this application process, again, is not being undertaken with the aim of glorifying or sentimentalizing the Kamikaze legacy in any way. The Chiron Peace Museum hopes its collection of more than 300 letters will gain a spot on UNESCO's Memory of the World Registry in 2017. Despite the pilot's suicide mission, a few kamikaze lived to tell the tale. Takahiko Ena is just one of those who survived. Very few pilots actually refused to take off. We felt we had to obey orders. But we all suffered until the last minute. And then we end up telling ourselves it's a good thing to die for your country. There were more than 2,500 missions, but only 18% of kamikaze attacks struck Allied targets. But whether history paints these men as fearless warriors or victims of the Japanese Empire, the highly controversial wartime tactic continues to spark diplomatic tensions. Well, now a bamboo and coconut leaf house may not seem like a match for typhoons, floods and earthquakes, but a new house design in Vietnam is proving otherwise. Well, it's not only sustainable, but also affordable. Take a look. The nearest road is a 10-minute motorbike ride away. The neighbours live in simple bamboo structures. Vo Van Dung lives here alone, growing papaya and limes. So far, so normal. But what makes this special is his house. This is a prototype, but one that has transformed his living conditions. The new house is safer. I'm not afraid that it will collapse or have a leak. There was water coming down from the roof in my old house. Sometimes, when there was a strong wind, I was afraid the house wouldn't survive. It was built a few months ago by an award-winning Vietnamese architecture firm. Their goal is to provide low-cost housing for the people who need it most and say the home can survive earthquakes, floods and typhoons. It is also surprisingly cool. We tried to design this house with the best ventilation system, with spaces by the roof and windows for better airflow. This model takes five men only three hours to construct. The materials cost $4,000, but they are trying to make it as cheap as possible. And the ultimate aim is to make a house that is flat-packed and can be built almost anywhere by anyone. This structure has a good advantage uh, for the light uh, weight. So uh, our goal is uh, the owner can construct uh, by themselves. The practice is developing the houses for free as they try to come up with a solution to providing low-cost dwellings for millions of people who live in disaster-prone areas. The founder says all architects have a duty to help the poor. I think one of the important tasks of architects is to work on projects for low-income earners. They have the rights to live in areas with utilities and comfort too. The aim is not just to build strong, cheap houses that can withstand whatever nature can throw at them, but one that fits in with the surrounding countryside too. And the hope is that in the coming years, these homes can be made on a bigger scale so people from the Philippines to Africa can have beautiful houses that don't cost the earth. 
Well, now, historically, tea has been the beverage of choice for the Chinese public. But now an increasing number of people are drinking coffee. Well, some Chinese producers have taken a different and lucrative approach to making the drink, all with the help of a small animal. It's the world's top tea producer. China is known for its delicious brew. In the Yunnan province, these poor leaves are worth several thousands of euros a kilo. But China's reputation isn't only great for tea, it's also becoming a coffee giant. In the same region, southwestern China, many fields are covered with coffee shrubs. Chinese farmers are growing more fond of these red cherries that first emerged in Mocha in Yemen in the 15th century. Compared to other crops, coffee is more profitable. Coffee bushes are robust, they don't fall sick and they resist insects. Basically, coffee is a good product and it's cheap to make. Before I started planting coffee bushes, I'd never drank any coffee. Now I do and it makes me happy. Coffee was first introduced to China by a French missionary in the late 1880s. But the Arabica coffee only started booming a hundred years later, thanks to government and international funds. Chinese farmers soon found a way to make more profit. And one of their tricks is this animal, a civet. This badger-like pet loves stuffing itself with coffee beans, even though they're hard to digest. Civets eat the beans, which ferment in their stomachs. They only absorb the skin and the rest goes in their feces. During that process, their stomach produces enzymes that go into the coffee beans. A non-traditional way to make coffee. It might seem disgusting to some of you. But in the end, Chinese farmers say it's worth it. One civet produces up to 100 grams of coffee a day. It's great because we make a lot of money from it. Civet coffee is exported worldwide. The luxury beverage is savoured in New York for up to 500 euros per kilo. Well, that's it for this edition. Thanks for joining us. I'll see you again next time on Access Asia.